Hi. Welcome to my show. Please come in. The first of my large paintings that I did during the pandemic uh, was this one. And it's a way of showing social distancing. And so I have the figures on either side. I have the two pictures, which are also distance. And it sort of um, just grew out of that whole idea of, of, you can see a house up here with being alone in a house and, and nobody comes, but if they do come, you're supposed to stay, you're not supposed to give them a hug or, or even a handshake. <laughs> you're supposed to, you know, do all this. So that's one of the social distancing paintings. This one, later on that winter, I moved everything downstairs into this room from my studio upstairs. And I set up still life on, on a big round table, but I had it here in the corner. And so I could have my back to the windows and the light would come in. Because down here, which is usually a living quarters, I didn't have the special lighting that I have upstairs in the studio. So I had it set up so I could be uh, in front of those windows and the winter light coming in was pretty good from there. This one, this setup, which had a lot of chairs around the table and which started out to be just a lot of chairs around a table in a still life, um, my son came over and said, oh, you made pandemic paintings. There's nobody here. There's there's all these chairs and there's nobody in them. And ordinarily, um, at Christmas time, and you know, the house would have been full of people, lots of people. And and here, it's, it's really quite sad. There's nobody here. But I set up the still life that had to do with the Christmas cookies then. And the Christmas cookie that everybody likes best is called a pineapple diamond. And so the stuff to make the pineapple diamonds, including the pineapple, are all here on the on the table. The cane symbolizes me, and uh, I made a number of paintings of this subject, which you'll see in other parts of the house. Some of the other ones, well, here's another one from that series um, with the Christmas colors, um, but nobody here. Nobody to open the present, nobody to do anything. <laughs> this is, uh, one of my New York paintings that I'm very fond of. It, it's a, a view from my window in the studio that I had in New York looking uh, east down 2nd Street and in the distance the Williamsburg Bridge. These are, these are all done from perception, from actually looking at the thing. They're not made up. That's, that's true of practically everything of mine. It's not made up. It may be abstract, but it's very much based on, on what I was looking at and how I felt about it at the time. These are little tiny ones that I did out of the um, big windows in the middle of winter. And so they show the house next door, the trees loaded up with uh, snow. Here are a picture of my house and a picture of the house next door. And they're both uh, kind of at sundown, whereas uh, the light is starting to fade away late, late in the afternoon. So I'm very interested in different uh, atmospheres of light and, you know, or fog or whatever, and try to somehow capture that in a canvas. It's much more usual to be trying to capture sunlight, but I like these other kinds of light also. I put a lot of uh, thought and effort into how to hang pictures, and every situation is different. If you're in a gallery, uh, if you're in a house like this, it's even harder because you have to work with the shape of the walls, and above all, you have to make the paintings flow. And and so we're kind of pinkish over here in color, and it gradually leads over into these blue and green paintings. And if you can't get that to work, they're not going to look as good and they can't be as close together as they are in a house. Uh, up above here is um, another one of the pandemic 
paintings that were done this winter with primarily blue and red instead of green and red in this case. Uh, but some of the same elements are still there. The chairs are there and the green bag is still there and some of the ingredients uh, for making the cookies are still there. In the corner there is our two landscapes. And so you kind of see how it, it's red and then it goes into a reddish, greenish paintings in the corner. One is of the last covered bridge in Wisconsin, which is near Cedarburg. And the other one is of Prairie Street, which is right outside in front of my house. Both are done in plein air outside on the spot. And over here, these, and so I've got two winter scenes from Sharon. Again, the house next door and looking on down the street that were done here uh, right from the windows last winter. The other two are from New York, looking out the window of my New York studio. One is a very bright kind of blue and white day like you get sometimes in the winter. The other one is a, a much more typical New York winter scene with a lot of gray in the sky and in the street, everything. The first one is like new fallen snow, all blue and white. The second one is like the aftermath. This is an, an older figure painting, which became a pandemic project for me to go back and finish some things that I had simply abandoned. And uh, this is one of them, which was started in New York and finished here. So, so we have a, a figure sitting on a stool, which was an actual pose, an actual person. And then to continue to work on it, it becomes more abstract because you can't see it. And you're more focused on getting the background and the painting and everything to work together. And I think that I did that here. Down here on the floor uh, is a relatively new painting, but it was done in New York, but it took me years to make. It's, it's called the Allegory of Music. And so it's really part of the series of the big six footers, but this one isn't smaller. And I, I'd worked a long, long time on this painting, trying to get it to work out. The uh, nude figure is from uh, a drawing by French artist Boucher. And the uh, figure with the cello is from a painting that I made from a model. And then I've combined those things with uh, landscape out the window and uh, still life in the studio. So it's again, it's one of those paintings that's done from imagination. Rosemary used to call that cooking it up. Um, there's some here of New York. But here's an easel sitting in the window and it you can see the correlation between the easel and the bridge. And I look for that kind of thing, uh, of things that I can repeat. Forms that I can repeat that are not the same, but that are the same. Bridge is huge and massive. The eagle is, is light and all that, but they, but they have that same pyramid kind of shape. So that's what I was thinking about there. This one, this is an interesting combination also, though. The... The one on the left is from Mexico in the 1970s. The one on the right is from New York. So they're widely different in time spans, but the use of the little squares and the little uh, sharp orange colors seem to me to be very much related. And so I think that they definitely go together. From St. Louis, and I'm on the uh, 30th floor and I'm looking out and I just love the way weather rolled in when you're up that high. And it just was, you know, this fantastic thing where, where you're very, very aware of the weather and clouds rolled in and, and so on. So this uh, painting is a stormy day. It didn't start out as a stormy day, but it became a stormy day. And as it became a stormy day, I very quickly drew in and made uh, the various 
shapes and areas that, I, that were rapidly disappearing, you know, in this darkness. And so I call this the storm. It's what I call a gift painting. A gift painting is one that for some reason or other, you had the energy to complete very quickly and without even hardly thinking. And when I quit that day, I knew I had a good painting and I had done it all as that storm rolled in over what I had started as a more normal uh, panorama of the city. So that is the storm. And as you can see, it has a lot of black lines and kind of slashy marks. The black lines refer way back to uh, when I first started to paint. I used to draw lots and lots of directional lines to let myself know which way different things were going. And when I got to the Kokoschka school, he broke me of that habit. And I don't generally do that anymore, or I only do it, and I don't do it in black. I maybe only do it with lighter colors at the beginning of a painting. But this particular one, the energy just came along with the storm to do it. Now, the other one, um, which I call homage to De Niro, and I don't mean the actor, I mean the painter, uh, who was his father, Robert De Niro Sr., they call it now. Uh, when the actor got prosperous, he asked his dad, who was, you know, very poor, if there was anything he could do for him. And uh, his father said, no, you're perfectly happy. I've got this space and I've got materials and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm great. So after a lot of conversation about this, he said, well, what I'd really like is to have four models at once. So I put them all four in at once, just in reference to that, because I thought it was such a, uh, such a great idea. I'd like to be able to afford four models at once. <laughs> I'll talk about this one, which is called the Allegory of Painting. These are all allegories. So this is the Allegory of Painting. And uh, you can see there's many things going on in here. Uh, way up at the top on the right, you have a New York landscape and you have just to the left of that, me painting on a painting, which is a still life. And then down on the lower right corner, you have a a quote, a transcription of two figures from Velasquez the Spinners, Arachne. And the, the painting is in the Prado. But she's not spinning, she's looking at or working on another painting. Uh, in the middle, smack in the middle of the whole canvas, everything is, is going around her is another person who is either drawing or painting. She's looking down at it in the lower part of the left, you've got a still life of mine that I've set up and I've painted, and I've got other versions of that without all this other stuff going on, but that's me. And in the book is Degas. And then the top left is a painting of rosemaries that I've quoted. And so we've got all this going on around the center point of the woman drawing. And and it's big, it's 72 inches across by 52 tall, I think. Um, so this is the second one in the series, the allegorical series of basically my life. I'm in all of the paintings and I'm usually painting in the painting because I am using mirrors to look at different things. Um, make this whole thing go together. There's a painting by Matisse called The Red Room, and it, it's nothing like this painting at all, except for the red. So in the Matisse, there's a kind of an all-pervasive red tone that fills the room and kind of holds everything together within the space. I'm very proud of this painting. I feel it. I got it out and I really thought, oh, wow, you know, I hadn't looked at it for a few years. Did I really do this? Uh, how did I do this? And sometimes when I look at something, I'm, you know, I, I, I very well know how I did it. Uh, but this is like mysterious. How did I do that? 
there are lots and lots of different relationships. The relationship between the woman with the white blouse and the bed with the white sheet and the green bedspread in her green skirt. I mean, that's very, you know, it really holds the corners together. You've got the pointed uh, peach colored orange thing in the bottom right. And then you've got the kind of painted peach color pointy table. You know, there are all kinds of repetitions of things that you would expect to be different that are the same in paint. And then uh, I like to pair that with things that you'd expect to be the same and that are different. Because pairs had been a kind of a obsession of last winter, both pairs of things and pairs of pairs. And this has pairs of pairs. I never even thought of it, but there you have a pair and then further back another pair. The two loaves of bread in a basket are like two lovers in a bed. Uh, things that you don't think of together are, you know, it's possible to have together in painting. And that's what's surrealistic about all painting, of course. And the kind of thing that uh, you can have something on your wall for 10 years and, and one day you're lying on the couch and you notice something you never noticed before. That even happens to me when I'm looking at my painting. So, yeah, I'm recommending this one. <laughs> So you have the painting that the woman is holding and you see the two blue horizontal bands in it. And then there's a, a kind of a, um, a repetition of an orange bowl and it flows right into the tabletop where there are also blue bands and an orange bowl. And yet you're, you're not aware of that until you've looked at it for quite a while. And I, I mean, some things that I put into a painting put in deliberately. The best things that I put into a painting I put in non-deliberately. And I worked on this for a whole winter, so I'm, you know, looking at it a lot and changing it. In a painting, you can visually, conceptually relate things that would never be together. And I try to make my, my paintings that. Um, that's not the fashion right now or today, but that's one of my main preoccupations with painting is how to make things that are not the same the same and how to make things that are the same different and so this painting does that I think pretty well. A big painting is definitely a, an expensive expenditure of energy so you you make this big investment in time and energy you intend to work on it a while. How long did this painting take you? Oh a whole winter but not every day, you know. I often trick myself into working in certain ways. If I'm looking at a painting and I'm thinking I should do this, not to delay and not to procrastinate and not to rethink that too much, just go do it. If it ruins it, I can always get it back. I can always get it back again. It'll be different though. So I also have enough confidence to know I can wreck it by trying something. Uh, I am standing here. I'm going to try to match this. Um, so I'm, I'm not really painting with my left hand. I'm looking in a mirror. And there you, you can see my other arm with the paintbrushes in it, which is actually uh, also backwards. The still life is set up of all the things that I was using in the series of paintings before this. And that series was called Vanitas, and it was a reflection on, on uh, Dutch painting of the 17th century, in which they depicted mortality or the uh, ephemer, ephemeral quality of life, which is symbolized by flowers and food and skulls, which stand for death, of course, but the other things which will also die. And so I made a, a long series, a big series of paintings based on that theme. And uh, here I kind of summarized the whole thing in this big pile up of stuff on the left hand side. And uh, me painting it, me reflected in the mirror and I'm also reflected in the mirror that I'm actually looking at over here. And uh, the little white figure, which symbolizes a younger, a much younger me. So this was the start of a series of, of large paintings. They're 72 inches across that 
I began and, and then I continued to do one of those every winter after that for quite a few years. Um, this is this is another one of them. Um, again, you can see me here. There's a reference to um, Titian here. As these paintings developed, I began using what I call quotes from other paintings. It was part of the whole appropriations scene in which artists would quote other artists. I, I don't quote them as realistically as many do, but I use little fragments of, from other paintings in my paintings. And in this case, it's Titian, it's called The Gypsy. It was earlier attributed to Giorgione. I also used one of Roseberry's male nudes. So I was going back and forth between all of those things and my own still life set up here in the foreground and the New York uh, view out the window. And um, behind uh, Titian's bridge is his landscape looking out. So we've got the, the paired two landscapes, me, uh, the still life, and the quotes from the other painting. The one on the wall is Rochefort on Terre in France. And uh, I did a, a number of paintings there of rooftops. So it's primarily the different angles and perspectives of the rooftops and trying to fit that all together and to make it a, both an interesting composition and also to read as rooftops and landscapes. That's the top one. The um, bottom one is Great Sands. Uh, it's a national monument in New Mexico in which uh, the river that runs through it at night totally goes away in the daytime because it's so hot. And I went there with um, a bunch of other people that were at a, a residency in New Mexico with me. Uh, they all wanted to hike up that thing. And I'm like, I think I'll just sit here and paint it. I didn't make this painting there. I made the painting later. I made gouache sweat sketches there. So this is a, one of the exceptions of a painting that's actually made from a study. The little one up above it, I call the red pole. And there, you know, in a perfectly an, uh, ordinary landscape is animated or made more, more dramatic by the red pole, really. This is is a plein air painting done in an unnamed town near Cedarburg in Wisconsin where um, Mary Kathleen and I went to paint outside one day and there's a pavilion, it's called Veterans Memorial Park and, and the thing is a war memorial, but it was pretty fascinating because you're going down a hill looking toward the pavilion and then you're looking away and I was trying to create a sense of scale between the lamp post and the pavilion. You know, how big is one, how big is the other? I went back and forth a lot on it until I felt that I had come to some resolution that makes the lamp post seem a long way from the pavilion, but also like you could walk along that path that's down there. And so when I'm in painting outside, I'm often thinking about walking through the painting as a way of getting in and out of it. And I did that so much that in New York, when I would be walking on 3rd Street, which I could see out of my window, I often felt like I was walking in one of my paintings. I was walking on the real street, just transformed somehow. So during the years I was in New York, I, I kind of gradually got into this, but I was doing one big one each year. They all have a self-portrait in them, which is not so maybe obvious in this one, but you can see me up there painting. And that is a, a real painting in the painting. And you can see out the window, the New York landscape. And uh, this is the first painting though, where I started doing quotes from other paintings. So this is two figures here on the figure in the middle are quotes from Velasquez, the spinners. And, and by quotes, I mean, they're not verbatim, but they are channeling a bit of Velasca. So if you, if you did a, a complete study of a Velasca painting, we would, we would call that a transcription. 
and it could be, you know, to whatever degree of finish or realism you wanted. So generally, when I do a transcription, which is a way of studying a painting, it'll be a sketch that I do in a museum, or maybe it'll be uh, done from a book, but I, but I won't carry it all the way to to where it looks like that painting. I'll just be studying the structure or the color in the painting. So these two figures are from the spinners, which is a rock, the ant's called. That's, and it's in the Prado. The one in the middle is, is also from the spinners. But she's not spinning. She's, she's either working on or looking at another painting. And then up in the left corner, I've quoted Rosemary. So that's, that is a, a quote from one of Rosemary's paintings, which I was looking at directly. I had it on the wall. The, the table arrangement was, was a still life that I was painting at the time. And, and there are a number of other paintings of that setup. It's Degas in the, in the book. So anyway, putting all that together, not exactly sure what the whole thing means, but uh, there you have it. <laughs> What's the um, painting in the upper right? That That is me working on a painting of mine. Yeah. Is that a painting that you still have? What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's, there are two paintings. There's one called Book One and Book Two. And um, they're both vertical paintings, but they came after this more horizontal study. But it's basically this painting that's down here with the with the book in it. Very nice. So it was was it a difficult composition to get right? Yes. Okay, that's that's going to be our second I, point. I worked forever on this, you know. It's very hard to put these pieces together. It's fairly easy to go looking around and finding pieces of things that you like, but to relate them any in any way very difficult. Now, I'm not claiming that they're conceptually related, conceptually related. Um, that's a whole nother ball of wax, but they're definitely visually related. And you've got the woman with the white blouse and the green skirt and the bed with the white sheet and the green spread on it. And, you know, that sets up a, a distinct correlation from right to left. And then the other direction, you've got the table up against the table in the in the painting and the outside, which is an actual thing out the window. And I just kept working on this until I, I felt like it was coming together. There were a number of studies for this. There were studies of the lovers and there were studies of the woman in the middle and there were studies of, of these two women. You know, I'm not a conceptual painter. Uh, you can't I get away from conceptualism because it's everywhere in art and and so you deal with it and you think about it sometimes but I'm more a relational painter and so I'm more about how does this painting fit together how does it work how how can I compose this so it makes a spatial sense that these things could all exist together and how do I make the viewer's eye move around so that they see it as all at once as one. And how do I uh, make the color works? Um, the painting is by Masaccio. And this is what is called a transcription, where you made a study from something, but you've done it in your, in your own style, in your own hand, in other words. And I, I do that a lot just for my own education. A, a pur purpose of a transcription is to study the original, but to study it in your own way and for what you want from it. So you're not a copy, you're trying to make another one of it. So it would be like taking a picture. This obviously is not like taking a picture of the Masaccio, but it's because I wanted to study how it worked and because I wanted to use it in one of these big allegorical paintings. So I used that in a big allegorical painting and Adam and Eve are on one side ex exiting paradise. So everybody recognizes this image, or at least within the art world, they would recognize this image. They would understand the illusion. 
And transcriptions I still make if I'm in a museum and I want to draw, I'll do it in, you know, maybe colored pencils or chalk or something, not in paint, uh, in a sketchbook. If it's something that's usually do in a sketchbook for your own edification and not to put in a frame and sell later. Many artists do that. Picasso particularly did many transcriptions, made a whole series on Delacroix, for instance, and he, you know, made it his own, but had, had that root. That one uh, next to it is another from the series on the cookies and the Christmas and the empty chairs. So you can see with those that there are a lot of different solutions to how to to work that. You know, this one has this great big zigzag shape of the cloth going back to the blue chair. That's a different kind of solution uh, from some of the red green contrasts and some of the other ones in this. So even though it's the same subject matter, I'm working lots of different ways of looking at it. And because I am using lots of different ways of looking at it, I don't get tired of doing it day after day. And it always seems like I can do another that is exciting enough that I uh, would like to do another. This one's from 2007. It's much lighter in tone and my, my work will get uh, darker and then lighter and then uh, darker again. And I don't, and people will say, are you depressed? No, it just does that. It, it goes from one thing to another. And last winter's paintings were fairly on the dark side. Um, and this one's more on the light side. So this was done in New York. Uh, it has the uh, two, big double window that was in the front of the studio are those squares that are at the top and lights coming in and lights coming through the cloth that I, uh, there weren't really curtains, but I tacked cloth up there to block the light so that it wouldn't get direct sunlight and so the light would be more diffused. You can see the radiator over there on the, on the left. Uh, there isn't anything I wouldn't put in a painting. So there's a radiator and it repeats the salary in, in a lot of ways. Another example of what I was talking about before. The radiator is upright, the salary is laying down, but they're both the same kind of green shape. And so they make your eye do this and that you know, that makes, that activates everything so that uh, you can get trapped in there and you don't want to leave and you want to keep looking.